Today I have a really cool interview. I really enjoyed uh, interviewing today's guest. His name's Todd Pulse. Um, he has a really cool story about how he got to 100 doors and he's had some trial and tribulations along the way, but um, you kind of expect that when you're gonna grow to the size of the portfolio that he has. So it's, it's a really interesting story to how he's grown. He hasn't used bank financing that much on his deals and he's still growing and looking to grow even more. So as always, um, go to YouTube and subscribe to wrestlingwithrealestate.com or go to the www.re podcast on Spotify, Podbean, and iTunes. And it's also available on wrestlingwithrealestate.com. So enjoy today's interview. Welcome to Wrestling with Real Estate, where we look to choke slam all your real estate problems. I'm your host, former WWE wrestler and now Cirque du Soleil performer, and of course, multifamily real estate investor. Now, today we have a special guest that <laughs> I just met yesterday <laughs> over Bigger Pockets, and we started talking, and here we are today recording. So, Todd, thank you for the quick turnaround. Thank you for doing this today. I know you're extremely busy, even though you're supposed to be retired, <laughs> you're extremely busy. Um, and I appreciate you giving us the time of day to come on the show. Yeah, no, I'm pumped up to be here. Not not as pumped up as uh, you are when I when I look at your pictures, but definitely pumped <laughs> to be with you. Uh, ex- excited, man. Been, so I may have been to the gym right before I took some of those photos. So. Uh, maybe <laughs> once or twice. Once or twice. That's all right, though. <laughs> well, cool. Well, like I said, thank you for being here. If you you know maybe you can give us a little bit of an insight into uh, your history and kind of what you're doing right now. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I'm in Dayton, Ohio, uh, not too far off where, where I think you got some properties. Uh, but I grew up in Dayton, Ohio, actually a little suburb called Riverside, Ohio. It's uh, kind of the same demographics of, of Dayton, but grew up in a trailer park and, uh, you know, got into law enforcement as a police officer, did that for 15, 16 years, uh, started running you know, as vice president of operations for a security company, which I still am today. Uh, then about 2013, I got the bug to get into real estate, and start building wealth uh, with, you know, for my family and their future. And uh, here we are, what, seven years later, and, you know, we got about 100 doors, and I self-manage all those and still work full-time, and, you know, that's what I'm doing, man, and, and still trying to scale. <laughs> yeah, you're a very busy guy, obviously, you know, likes to keep yourself very busy, which is, which is cool, but I think it's something that you enjoy. Um, how, you know, you left the police force, you were in the police force for, you said, 15 years? Yeah, right about 15 years. Okay, okay, and then... Um, was that a case of when you left, you wasn't sh- you weren't sure what you were going to do next? So you wanted to invest in real estate. How how did real estate investing start for you? Yeah, so I think for me, um, you know, like the last nine years of my my police career, I was only part time, right? So I had moved on to a corporate job. I was doing corporate investigations for a large retail store, and you know, traveling around the the country, interrogating and uh, interviewing people that were stealing from us, right? Associates and and large booster crews. Um, and then we kind of came a point where you know my wife and I had had a kid or a little guy and she was done with me traveling. She was done with me being away every other week and said, I want you to come home. And I had a relationship with the owner of a security company back here locally who I'd worked for uh, for many years off duty and part time. And he gave me an opportunity. It kind of just worked out where he had an operations manager spot there. And uh, I came back and, you know, started running the company for him and we grew pretty significantly. I took a huge pay cut to come back. Uh, and when I did that, that's kind of when I said, look, I, I know that eventually I'm going to be back where I was at uh, with a good salary, but, I also need to start thinking about building wealth. And, and when I was young and I was single and you know, I'd, I'd order the, the videos on, you know, at 3 a.m. when they came on the infomercials, I never read them, but I, but I order or never read the books and never watched the videos, but I, but I did order them. Uh, so I'd always thought about real estate. And for me, I'm not, you know, I have a college degree in law enforcement, but I, I don't have a business degree. I don't have, you know, some master's degree in finance and, and like, that's just not my thing. Right. And, and I didn't get that as a kid growing up with my family. I, uh, you know, my dad didn't give me those those skills to be able to really handle finances and understand that. So uh, it was hard to find what was going to help me build that wealth. And, and for me, real estate, I got it right. Like like I could put some numbers together and figure out if it makes sense. Like I know if I'm bringing in a thousand dollars and spending eight hundred, I know I'm making two hundred bucks, right? Like that was easy enough for me. And I thought, you know what, I can do this. And you know, my one of my expertise is is in interrogations, and, and I'm good at getting people to tell me all their deepest, darkest secrets and stuff that they don't want to admit to. And I thought if I could do that, right, if I can negotiate a new car deal, like I certainly can negotiate a real estate deal. 
and and that excited me and and that's kind of when i made the jump to uh to jump into real estate i'm, I'm kind of scared now i'm kind of scared to to say anything because you're going to get everything out of me and everything i did when i was 12 years old when i'm I, I didn't, I'm sorry, Mrs. Jones. I broke your window. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you'll be fine as long as you don't let your wife watch the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, yeah, I th and I think it's it's like you said to me. It was the same thing. You know, I don't really understand the stock market too well. I understand that you buy a stock and it goes up, it goes down, whatever, blah blah blah. But you, there's so much, so much more. It's more complicated than that, obviously. And but to me, and real estate is really easy to understand, right? You buy an asset, you rent it out, you get the rent in, you take care of the property and you profit from that, right? Hopefully, right? And it's not quite as simple as that, but it's very easy to understand to me. And that, that's why I love about it. And I think that's what appeals to so many people. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Cool, cool. So you bought, when, when was the first investment property that you bought? Is it 2013, you said? What was that and what did it look like? Yeah, so our first, our first property was 2013 and uh, it was probably the scariest time of my life, right? And uh, we, I had like 10,000 bucks saved up in one of my, one of my retirement accounts. And I, I told my wife, I said, look, cause I'm going to jump into real estate one way or the other. Like I'm going to buy something like I might lose on my win, but, but I'm buying something. Like I, I just had that bug. So I went to, uh, you know, the, the, who I mentioned earlier, the owner of the security company who he was in real estate a little bit at that point. I mean, he had, you know, 30, 40 units at the time. Um, and I went to him, I said, Hey, I got 10,000 bucks. If, if I can find us a, a four unit building for $20,000, will you match my 10 and uh, let's buy it together? Cause I was too scared to, you know, try to come up with the other 10 by myself. And he said, you know, he kind of laughed at me for a minute, right? Like, where are you going to find a four unit building for $20,000? So, uh, but he agreed to it. And then I started, you know, searching. So like two or three months later, I came across a property and I think it was actually listed at like 65,000. Right. And uh, it was on MLS. And, and, and I said to myself, this is way out of the price range, but I need to start practicing negotiating and I need to see where the margins are at. Like where are people willing to drop a little bit? Um, so I started negotiating with this guy that had it for sale. And what I found out that he had it on land contract and he was had it on land contract from the actual owner who was in Iowa, who had bought it on auction for like $18,000 uh, from a foreclosure auction. And during that conversation, I, I also learned that he hadn't paid the owner a single dollar in the last six months that he had it on land contract. So we kind of side skirted and we went to the owner in Iowa and he was, he was just a small investor. He bought a couple properties out of state, had zero luck, was losing his butt on them. And, you know, we kind of, we just negotiated with him and said, look, if we can take this guy out of the picture, we sell us the property for uh, $19,000. And he said, yes, yeah, I'll, I'll get rid of it. That's want my money back out, but I want to stop losing. So then we transitioned back to the guy that had a land contract. who was a shady little handyman, you know, real estate investor, right? But yeah. shady little handyman. <laughs> And at the end of the day, we gave him, you know, we told him we'd give him a thousand dollars just to walk away and let us buy from the, the original owner. Uh, and he agreed to it. So, you know, that was our 20,000 right there. I think the best part about that, because this guy was shady and stealing from the owner and not paying anything, is when we went to the closing table, uh, he got his check and he got his check for $200. He's like, well, you guys are supposed to give me a thousand. He had forgotten to check his water bill and he had like an $800 delinquency <laughs> water bill that he had to pay. Uh, so yeah, we ended up getting that for 20K and then you know, my partner on that, he put in 12K to rehab it. So we're all in at 32,000. It was cash flowing, you know, completely rented out. That was actually the best building that I, I think I've ever had. And, you know, within a year, I took my partner out of it and, and had it on my own and uh, ended up selling that, uh, I don't know, like two years ago, I sold it for the first time on land contract. And at about a year, that guy defaulted. And then uh, within like a couple of weeks, sold it to another guy straight out. Uh, so we kind of double sold it. We did really, really well on it. Uh, but we ended up selling that property for right around ninety thousand dollars the second time, and uh, if you figure out what we actually made on it the first time, it was right around forty thousand the first time. So, all in about one hundred thirty thousand dollars cash out on thirty two thousand dollars property. Um, and then the really cool thing is the guy that bought it the second time, uh, he's in Nevada, so kind of out there close to you. Uh, and four months ago, him and and two other people, we started another real estate company together. So it's funny how relationships work, but uh, that was our first deal and. Uh, I, I would have kept that building forever, but my wife wanted an in-ground pool and you know, <laughs> I had to, I had to subside to her needs. <laughs> and we know how that goes, right? Who's always going to be the winner there, right? <laughs> there, there is no trophies in relationships, right? And when you figure that out, I think you can be successful in relationships. Well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, that's a really cool story, you know, and <clears throat> maybe give us some context, you know, back in 2013, right? Was, was, 
<clears throat> to get to, to some people picking up a fourplex for twenty thousand dollars is seems you know outside of the realm of <laughs> any kind of possibility but were prices a lot lower then in 2013 or, or was it just that you guys got a crazy good deal yeah i think it was just a crazy good deal you know and um you can still pick properties up in our area in dayton uh, you can still find fourplexes for you know twenty to thirty thousand dollars if you're really hunting down off market deals now, I don't think that they'll be in as good a condition and, and your rehab is going to push closer to 30, 40 K. Um, so you can still get in. The price of entry is still low if you really bird dog and, and search these properties. Uh, but I think what happened was, you know, around that time, all the foreclosures were soaring, right? So like properties were just now starting to like bank off and, and people are buying them up from all over the country and everybody had those big googly investor eyes. So once they got these great deals on the properties, they, they didn't have no teams in place. They didn't have any management teams in place. So they were just searching and scrapping. And a lot of them were getting their you know, butts handed to them by local guys who were, didn't have the money to buy them on auction, but they had the wherewithal to go after the investors that they knew were going to be desperate to try to manage these properties. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those investors that picked them up cheap, they were just, you know, they were in trouble and they were ready to walk away from them. And I think that's where we stepped in and, and, and really capitalized on it. So a little bit different now, the market, you know, our market in Dayton right now is great. Uh, it's stable, you know, not crazy appreciation, but it also doesn't lose a ton of money when, when our markets suffer. So the price of entry is a little bit higher now. You got to work a little bit harder to find the properties, but you can still get good deals. You know, you can still get a cash flow on property for, uh, you know, 65 to, to 85K and, and do very, very minimal work in it and still be okay. Um, so, but it was a little bit different back then. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's definitely a great first deal. <laughs> I think most people would take that as a first deal. But then, you know, obviously since then, to, you know, to, from 2013 to we're in 2020 now, you know, to scale from that first property to over 100 doors, you know, in seven years, that's, that's a lot of scaling, you know. Be it, what, are they mostly duplexes? You know, roughly what, 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 what is that makeup of that uh, portfolio, just so people get an idea? Yeah, so ours are all multifamily, right? And you know, what my sweet spot, what I really, really love is I love the single story, all brick, slab, triplexes, quads. Like, that's what I really like, right? Like for maintenance, um, for, for a lot of reasons. I know a lot of people really go after the big multifamily doors. And, and the other real estate company that I'm partners in with uh, Morgan, Brian, and, and John, uh, we're going after the bigger multifamilies. You know, we've, we've closed a 21 unit this year. We've closed an eight unit. Uh, we're getting ready to close on a 16 unit together. Um, and, and that's great. That's that piece of business. But for me personally, I like the advantages you have when you have four doors or under, right? So you don't have to step to the commercial loans. Um, you have multiple buildings with the same number of units. So if you have losses, you can, you can place those where you need to place them at. Uh, if you want to refinance, you know, so if you got 10 buildings on the same street, but they're all under four or four or under, uh, you don't have to refinance them all at the same time. Whereas if you have a big 48 unit or hundred unit, you got to finance a whole building uh, to refi and burr out of it. So there's a lot of benefits to it, but I, but I really like that. And what I find is in this area, there's still a lot of mom and pop owners. So the tries and the quads, um, absolutely. You can jump in and, and steal some of those at good deals. Um, I have one, like one single family home. Uh, it's great. It's a great rental. I mean, you know, we stole that. I think we bought it for uh, like 2000 bucks back taxes, stuck $10,000 into it. It's, it only appraises about 50,000, but it also rents out for 725 a month right now. So, you know, I, I keep that one because it's hard to justify getting rid of it. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's the only single family. Everything else is a, is a tri, a quad uh, or bigger. And, and I just like the, the opportunity, right? So if you got two units vacant in your building, if you bought it right, you can still pay your bills and not and, and be okay. Uh, so that's just kind of where our sweet spot's at. And that's what we love. And, you know, that's what we go after now. We're still going after. Yeah, it's obviously worked very well for you. Um, so, you know, for most people, they understand that um, for the most part with, with um, Freddie and Fannie loans, you, you can only get 10 under your own name, right? And then if you have, if you say, if you use, utilize your wife as well, you can get 20. How, how have you managed to scale to so many properties um, with that, you know, with, with a, has financing being an issue for you guys? No, and, and I'll tell you really why is uh, I, you know, just about a year ago, I, I still didn't understand money. I, I understand how to spend it. I understand how to <laughs> save it. Um, I understand what it means to have money and what it means not to have money. <clears throat> but I didn't understand really how to use and leverage debt and things like that, right? So that was always my weak point that kind of kept me from scaling a little bit. But, you know, the first deal that we did was a cash deal. Uh, the second deal, which was the only deal we've ever lost on that we didn't talk about, 
Uh, that was a cash deal, even though we didn't make any money on it. Um, and then the, the next deal, which was like 34 units between 10 buildings on the same street, that was an owner finance deal with uh, zero money out of my pocket. And we were able to, you know, get that free and clear with, within like four or five years by raising rents and, and bringing it up. So at that point, even when you're up to, you know, 40, 45 units, we, we hadn't done any financing, like we had no loans whatsoever. Um, and really just until the last several months, we did loans. I mean, I, we did a refi here recently on like three buildings just to, you know, reinvest in some other stuff, but we haven't utilized loans. Now on our, our other company where we are utilizing some loans, uh, we're, we're following really the Burr method. I mean, we, you know, we've been doing Burr right before, like that was a cool word before it was trendy. And uh, that's, you know, here recently with some of the, those loans, we've, I've started learning a lot about financing, especially the commercial side of things. Um, but we're not using Fannie or, or Freddie or any of those right now. So at some point, maybe it'd become an issue, but um, I like to find creative ways to finance it. And, you know, one of the things I really love is, is getting an owner to finance a deal, right? Like that's, a, that's what everybody strives for. And I think if you read bigger pockets, there's uh, a lot of guys on there that will say, you know, owner financing doesn't exist. It's rare. It's, uh, it's this and this, and I want them to keep telling everybody that, right? So they don't go after it because it does exist. Yeah. And almost every deal that I've done has been owner financing, uh, and even on some flips, you know, owner financing. So, you know, it's kind of how we've avoided that. Yeah, that's the way to do it. If you can do it, you know, you've obviously found the sweet spot and found a way to do that. Um, and I think, I think, you know, anyone who can get seller financing for the right with the right terms, I think it's a, the best kind of deal you can get. Um, you said some interesting points there. Maybe talk about your second deal then, you know, obviously you've had a lot, mm. lot of success. If you don't mind, if it's not yeah. too painful, you said that's the only deal you've ever lost money on. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. There might be some lessons that people can learn from. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, it's still painful this day, but, uh, yeah, 2000, 2013, we closed that first deal. And I, I think, you know, I, I shared with you the numbers, that was a home run. Right. And, uh, you know, three months later after we were in there and it was cash flowing and, and good, I, I thought, man, like, world's not the world. Like I can do this over, over and over. Right. Like what they call it. Yeah. Like rinse and repeat. Like I knew that we could keep doing that. So I went out and I found another, uh, another property that was off market. It was a six unit building. And this, like, I, I can't even describe to you how big of a home run this would have been. Right. Like this was all townhome style setups. It was still in a, you know, C class neighborhood, but uh, there was a guy who owned it before us and he was, you know, dealing dope out of there while he was rehabbing it. And he had four of these apartments just completely decked out, right? Like travertine tile. And like, it was, it was crazy. Like it was beautiful. And it had said vacant for two years because he was ultimately uh, killed in one of the units uh, two years earlier. Wow. So it was behind taxes. It was with his family and probate. And we went to the family and, and said, Hey, can we take this off your hands for the taxes? So you don't have to worry about it. And I think it was like right at like 19, five. And at the end of the day, we had to come up with 21, five K or 21,500 cash. Um, and I did that with my same partner at the time. Uh, so we, we did that and we closed on a Friday night and, and paid cash for that property. Now, mind you, this is set vacant for two years, like no damage, no vandalism. It only had, you know, we was going to stick like 30 K into it. It was going to be rent ready, ready to roll. Like this thing was a home run. And Friday night, we closed at like six o'clock at night. Monday morning, I woke up, I was drinking my coffee early in the morning. I was getting ready to go meet some contractors over there feeling, you know, like the king of real estate at that point. Right. And I'm watching the, the local news and, and I see an apartment building that's just completely engulfed in flames. And I thought, man, that's a, that looks familiar. You know, that looks, I think I've seen that building somewhere, right? And uh, that was our apartment building. And over the, that night, somebody threw a Molotov cocktail through uh, the window where the guy was shot and killed two years earlier. So I think we can assume what it was. But the worst part of this deal and how we lost money on it was uh, we closed late on a Friday night and we did not bind insurance coverage on it. So we had no insurance on it whatsoever. Uh, so we just lost our cash and it was only 21 K mm -hmm. and right now, if I lost 21 K it was, it would be painful, but I'm in a much different place in my life. And back then, like, like I was eating up savings, right? Like that was it. Like my wife was freaking out over $10,000 and, and I was scared out of my, you know, my mind then too, to spend 10,000 bucks. I don't know if I'd ever make it up, you know, now we're doing million dollar deals and it's, it's, it's not as big of a deal. Um, but back then it was painful, you know, and the worst part was, is the city wouldn't let us tear down that building uh, without doing asbestos removal. So when we got quotes in to tear down the building and remove it, they were coming in at like sixty, seventy thousand dollars doing asbestos removal on a property that we only paid twenty-one thousand dollars for. Yeah. Uh, so we've uh, since then, since two thousand thirteen, my partner and I, we've been paying the taxes on that property every year since then. So every year tax season, we get that reminder of, hey, you messed up, right? <laughs> so uh, that's it. So now it's just a green space, and and we pay taxes on the green space, and you know, 
it is what it is but wow uh, yeah so so the so you guys just ended up having to just tear it down and leave nothing there or did you what did you have to end up doing with that property well it it sat there it sat there boarded up we mowed the grass we kept care of the property um we we just we we didn't tear it down at the point we were trying to you know work through some uh, different angles to be able to donate the property back to the city so they could turn it into green space for the community. Uh, but a lot of the cities ended up with some grant money over the last couple of years to tear down properties like that. Uh, so kind of fortunately, the city ended up with some grant money and tore that building down for us and turned it into some green space. Uh, and that actually just happened a few months ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Cool. Well, I think the lesson, I guess, there is to make sure that you have insurance, right? You never... Insurance. Never know. <laughs> insurance every time. Never, never know what um, can happen, right? You, you know, you, you thought you had a home run deal. So um, thank you for sharing. I'm so, sorry that happened to you. Um, but thankfully, you, 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 you know, that, that wasn't the end of the road for you, right? And that, you it know, was not. You, no, it yeah. was not. <laughs> so then you mentioned this, something else that you, I think it was a 36 unit portfolio that, of 10 properties that you bought owner finance from, from someone. For the next yeah, year? so the, the, the next deal after that was an owner finance deal. It was uh, 30, 34 uh, doors mm -hmm. uh, spread across 10 buildings, and that was an owner finance deal. Tell, yeah, tell us a little bit about that deal and tell, you know, how we found the owner, fin uh, how you managed to negotiate the owner financing and kind of the numbers on that deal. I think that sounds like a great deal, too. Yeah, so that was, um, that's kind of a unique deal, right? Like, I think a lot of that's about relationships, but at the time, my, my, my partner and, and also my boss and you know my mentor he uh he had these doors and uh, one of the things that he learned was he had not enough time to do everything right like he's an entrepreneur he's one of the smartest guys you'll ever meet in your life right like he's he's like the rain man when it comes to numbers uh and it just you know he's been my mentor and taught me everything that i that i've learned in real estate for the most part uh, but one of the things that he wasn't super great at the time was being a landlord and that's because he had so many things going on right like he was Run a security company. He was running uh, his his other organizations. He was a retired police officer. He had you know had a couple of his properties at the time. So there was kind of an opportunity there to step in uh, when this property was you know uh, not really cash flowing a lot of money. And and we kind of talked and and he was open to the idea of him owner financing that property for me. And I think a lot of it was like taking it off his plate where he was done being a landlord. Um, so we worked out a, a pretty decent deal on that. You know the the rents were all below market rent. The property was in decent shape, but a little bit deferred maintenance. Um, so we got into that pretty quickly with no money down, and uh, you know by raising the rents and, and continuing to move that portfolio forward, we were able to you know get that property free and clear within just a couple of years. Wow, that's incredible! Great deal. Another great, another another good one to add to the to the list of good properties. Um, you mentioned earlier that you know that one of your strengths is negotiation, right? Um, that you're able to get negotiate. You know, before before you got into real estate, you said I can negotiate a great deal on a car, so I should be able to do the same on real estate. And obviously, you you negotiate sure. some, some good deals. What are what are some of the, the the things that you can maybe pass on to people in terms of negotiation, without maybe not giving away your secret sauce because you don't want everyone to know, maybe. But you know, some some tips that, that people can take away in terms of negotiation. Yeah, so I think negotiations, right? Like it's it it's a game. Uh, you know, it's a cat and mouse game, and I think a lot of people see that. And I think there's two ways to really approach negotiations. Like when I'm dealing with an owner finance deal, that's a completely different type of negotiation, right? Um, and when you're jumping into an owner finance deal, uh, a lot of that is building a relationship and building a rapport and building some credibility with, uh, with the owner of that property. Because most of the time, these are going to be off-market deals. And not only are you trying to convince them to sell their property, but you're also convincing them to owner finance that deal. And for me, it's just about building that relationship. You know, I... I I, I wish I could share some details on one that I'm working on now because it's really cool, but I can't because I'm not closed up on that yet. Um, but for me, it's just about that constant communication, right? Like, let's go to lunch. Let's uh, let's talk on the phone. Like, hey, how are you doing? And for the first 30 days, for the first two weeks or however long it takes, like we might not even negotiate numbers. We might never talk about numbers. We're not talk about finances. It might just be talking about family or, hey, how's your week going? Or, uh, you know, whatever it might be. I'll tell you like a, a trailer park owner that's an older guy and uh, you're, you're trying to work through with him to convince him to sell it and owner finance it. You know, some, some of these guys out there that, that have been in the business for a long time, they have more knowledge that they're going to forget than most of us will ever learn. And sometimes using that to play against it, right? Like, and, and for me, I legitimately do want to learn from them. Like, I want to hear their stories. I want to hear the war stories. And sometimes that makes them feel good too, that they're, they're not just selling it off to some, you know, crazy cat that's going to go and change their property up. Like they want to know they're turning the property over to, 
um, somebody that's going to take care of it because they probably love that property and probably care about that property, uh, which is why they're not listing it, which is why they've had it for so long. So that's a completely different negotiation. And I think you really have to develop that relationship and that rapport. Some of these other properties um, that are out there, especially with you know what I see with out-of-state investors and um, others that, that call themselves investors, sometimes you just got to use their arrogance against them, right? Uh, there's guys out there that, that uh, and, and gals that think they know everything about real estate. They think they know everything about numbers. And, uh, and sometimes you just got to, you know, use that arrogance against them. You got to suck up your pride a little bit and let them think they're leading the, leading the rodeo, right? Until it's too late and they're locked into a deal. Uh, but you got to gauge your person. It's no different than, you know, the, than you and wrestling and, and everything else you do, right? Like everybody sizes up their opponent. And if you're good at knowing what your opponent's going to do or uh, forecasting what they might do in the future, then you can kind of create that game plan to go into this, right? So if you know they're arrogant, if you know they're going to uh, want to lead the conversations, then let them do it. You know, act like the guy that has no knowledge. Like let them lead that conversation, right? And, and I want to use their strengths against them and I want to use their weaknesses against them. Um, and I don't want them to see me as a threat at that point. So, you know, it, it's kind of broad, but just a couple of ways that I approach it with, with, with owners and, and other investors. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice. You know, I think creating that relationship first um, before being like, hey, I want to take your property off from you, you know, because like you said, a lot of people that they, they do become emotionally tied to these properties, especially someone who's owned the property for a while, you know, there might be a story behind that. It might be um, they bought that, bought that property when their son was born or something like that. So, they, you know, they all, a lot of it comes down to emotion, right? It's understanding that emotion and that, you know, it's more than real estate and numbers to a lot of people. And if you're able to create that relationship with them and to show them that you're going to take great care of that property, that property means something to you as well. You know, they're going to be a lot more willing to, to work with you. And then it's also, like you said, understanding personalities, right? <laughs> In real estate, as yeah. most people know, you know, you do get people that are, very arrogant, very full of themselves. And that's fine. You know, maybe they've worked their way up to that. And so you kind of deserve to be in that position, but it doesn't mean that you can't use that to your advantage. You know, you've got to understand personalities and kind of adapt to different situations and different personalities. So I think that's, I think that's great advice for people. Yeah, absolutely. We all have something that makes us tick, yeah. you know, and, and finding out what that is, is, you know, that's key to every negotiation. Yeah. Yeah. So apart from your first deal, which, you know, was a great deal, what would be one of your favorite deals that you've done, you think? Oh, geez. I, I you <laughs> know, I, my, my first deal was always my, was always my favorite deal, but you know, we, we flip properties as well. So um, I, I really enjoy the flipping piece of it. I, I enjoy going into a property that's just completely destroyed and like the worse, the better. Like I love it. Oh, really? Uh, and this is uh, you, the, if, if it, you know, the, the completely messed up property, foundation issues yeah. roofs none of that scares you no well you know i mean there's lots of things that scare me right but i'm <laughs> i'm too stubborn to admit it but you know, it was kind of funny like last night on instagram uh my, one of my actually one of my business partners brian he's in nevada he has uh, quite a few properties are rehabbing right now in ohio and he had posted on his instagram a picture of this this house like it was it, like the worst house you'll ever see in your life right like it had fire and rafters were out of it and city was like giving him code violations and uh, he put, you know, one of those little things on there, like who else would buy this house, right? Like nobody yeah. responded. But of course I said, absolutely. I'd buy that house, but can you show me the pictures of the two next to it? So I can buy those as well. Right. <laughs> um, so I think it's just, you know, I really love the, the rehab pieces of things. Uh, but if we're talking just a specific deal that I really love, uh, one of our more recent deals here in Dayton was with, with my new uh, real estate group. And we found a, uh, 16 unit building that had a small building out front uh, and that small building out front had five units in it plus a commercial space downstairs. So uh, 21 units total and commercial space downstairs, lots of deferred maintenance on it. You know, I think when it originally came on the market, it came on the market at like, you know, 500 some thousand. Uh, when you walk the property, you know, you, you heard the stories from the tenants um, that their landlord just didn't do anything for them. They had an out state guy that was you know, trying to manage it, but he wouldn't put any money into the property with the management company he was using. Uh, it, it wasn't big stuff, right? Like gutters falling down or, uh, you know, landscaping not being done. The hallways were, were dingy. They had a washing machine that didn't work because he wouldn't pay anybody to come clean the drains up. So we ended up negotiating that deal down and he was actually, uh, it's kind of a funny story really for us because it doesn't typically happen because usually you're negotiating with the owner. But in this case, uh, he had defaulted on his loan so bad and his lender had 
actually had him sign off that they were going to do negotiating for him and decide the deal. <laughs> so he was kind of, you know, he was, he started off really arrogant, like the first time, right? So like five months before that, when he put it on the market, I, I called and talked to him and, and I gave him an offer that was way above what we ended up buying it for. And super, super arrogant, like, oh no, I'll sell this property. It's worth way more than that, blah, 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 right? So we let it sit. It fell out of contract a couple of times. And then finally, when it popped back on the market, uh, we ended up negotiating with his lender directly. And uh, we ended up coming in on that property and we negotiated a deal at like 290000 for, you know, all 21 units, both buildings. Wow. And uh, the best part was the lender said, hey, we've lost our butt on this deal, right? Like we, we've lost our money. We have these investors that, you know, have, have pooled their money and we're using their funds, you know, like a read or, or however a lot of these hard money guys do it. And they said, so we'll sell to you for that price, but will you do us a favor and use us as your lender? And we said, sure, you know, like <laughs> we ain't got to go to another lender and find it. So they end up, they end up financing that deal for us um, at 90%. Wow. And uh, it was only at like a five, I think we had like a five and a half percent interest rate on it. So we didn't have to go to any of our lenders. Like they were like ready to lock in, like signing paperwork. I and mean, we had to give them a few documents, um, but not only did we lock that in. So I, I almost consider that like an owner financing deal, right? Yeah. Um, but we ended up buying this thing well below market value, um, you know, straight from the lender who says he's going to, you know, finance us at 90%. Um, we're finally at the point right now where we're getting ready to buy out of it. Um, and that property will appraise probably about 650, 675,000 uh, six months later. This was just, you know, five and a half months ago. But what I love about the story is this, is a lot of people get nervous about C-class or D-class areas or rougher communities. And like, that's really where our niche is at. Like, we love it, but we don't love it because it cash flows well. Um, I love it for a completely different reason than some people do, because I think that um, everybody deserves a nice, safe place to live and, and somewhere that they can be proud of. So when we buy these distressed properties, um, sometimes I, I, I don't get emotionally attached, but there is an emotional attachment to some of the tenants because they've been neglected for so many years by so many landlords that don't do anything. So when we come into these properties like this one, we came in, we painted the hallways, we put new VCT down, we got them brand new laundry equipment. We, there was like seven vacancies, you know, we completely rehab those with, you know, LVT and, and, and fresh paint, and, um, all kinds of other things. Um, and we took care of their maintenance needs. You know, when they called us, we fixed it. If, if they had something going on, we fixed it. And just the, the emotions from some of them and the appreciation from some of them that they finally had somebody that was going to take care of them, uh, that makes you feel good. And, and knowing that you can turn some things around and, and take care of some people that maybe they, they would like to live in another area, but they can't live in another area because that's where their income level's at. Uh, and being able to do that and turn a property around that they neglected for so long. Um, we love it, you know, and, and we love those properties. So I love that story not only because we got a great deal on it, um, but also because of all the tenants there that, that are finally being taken care of that were neglected for so long. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I think it's great that you guys were able to do that because just because they live in a C class, D class property, they're still paying rent. They still deserve a place to live. They're doing, you know, they're paying as much as they can in rent to live there, you know, so they deserve. And I think, you know, a lot of times, like you mentioned, it is those lower class properties that, that you find the slum laws in, you know, that they don't fix stuff. They let them live in conditions that are far from ideal, you know, and I don't think that's right. It's just like you said, these people deserve to live in a good, safe environment, right? They're paying the rent just like anyone else. So I'm, I'm glad that um, they, ha they have a good landlord like yourself. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you self-manage all your properties. Um, we do, yeah. All 100 dollars. Do you have a team or is it just, just you for the most part? So from a management standpoint, it's just me. But um, I am, you know, I and my, my partnership, my wife, like we're blessed that we have some uh, really incredible guys that, you know, they're contractors. We don't have any employees, but I've had a team that's been with me for maintenance and rehabs and um, just, you know, landscapers. I mean, all of them are personal relationships that I've developed over the years. It's, it's not going out and hiring a company, but they're very dedicated. They're very loyal. We try to be really good to them and take care of them. Um, but, you know, I know that I can call them anytime at night and they'll, you know, they'll help us out. Um, but we also have a group, if that group fails, right, which doesn't happen often, uh, but we've also worked hard on creating that network of professional contractors out there. I mean, you know, I mean, the biggest one, right? Like, so if you start landlording, or start buying properties and you don't have a phenomenal drain guy, like you're out of your mind, right? Like it's always like Saturday night on a holiday where you got a main drain clogged up or something. So uh, we have a great group of networkers or a great group of contractors that we've networked with that I know I can call them anytime of the night. 
Um, I'll, I'll tell you one of my one of the best tools that I have in my tool belt uh, is uh, my father-in-law, right? So my father-in-law is just an incredible human being, right? One of the one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet in your life. Just you know, if you want to know how to be a man, like he's the guy that you watch and you model after. Um, he's a retired HVAC guy, but he's also like the jack of all trades, right? Uh, he knows how to do everything. Uh, and if he doesn't know how to do it, he's never going to tell me that he doesn't know how to do it. <laughs> but, you know, he's been at properties with me at midnight, right? Or if I go inspect a property and do my due diligence, he comes out and hangs out with me and rides along with me and, and does it for free. He doesn't expect anything out of it. He's one of my, you know, he's, he, he's my best friend too, you know, out, outside of all this. Uh, but, you know, he, he'll do absolutely anything for me with these properties. He's, you know, a little retired and had some shoulder surgery, so he can't do all the physical labor. Um, but just the guidance and advice and, and being able to shoot him a picture of, you know, some historic HVAC, you know, unit in a basement that I'm looking at and, and knowing that I'm going to get that feedback, uh, that, that gives me a certain level of confidence knowing that he's in my, in my tool belt to use. So we have, we have great people. And I'll tell you, outside of that, uh, we have a, a phenomenal group of friends, you know, the, the core group of couples that we hang out with, uh, they're just great people and they're there to support us. They know that if we're hanging out and something happens, I gotta, I gotta leave. And, uh, maybe I got to take the car that, you know, that my wife and I came in, they know they got to take care of her or whatever it is. But, you know, all of those are our contractors, our, our guys that work for us on a daily basis. Uh, you know, my father-in-law, our, our phenomenal group of friends, like all that comes together and makes this really easy. And I have a phenomenal software system. That I use, so, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's, it's just like everything else, right? It's just who you surround yourself with, right? If you surround yourself with great people who, um, are willing to help you and that, you know, that they're, they're supportive in whatever you do and, you know, of, they can do what, <laughs> what needs to be done. Um, you know, you can do anything. And I think your testament to that, to, to, to being able to, um, own a hundred doors and manage it yourself, you know, not have, not have a team come in to, to, to do that is phenomenal. Maybe talk a little bit more about that because I think the management aspect of real estate scares a lot of people, right? You, I always sure. hear you, and maybe you hear the same is that oh, I don't want to be fixing toilets at midnight, like you mentioned, right? But it, it doesn't necessarily need to be the case, right? For one, you can hire a property management company, but if you don't want to do that, you, you know, you, you, you think you're throwing money away. Um, you know, th there are ways to do it. Um, so maybe talk about a little bit about how you're able to manage a hundred doors by yourself. I know you talked about teams, but you still have to collect rent, right? You still have to do leases. You still have to, um, organize turns, you have to organize these teams, you know, maybe, maybe talk a little bit how you're able to do that. And for someone maybe looking to get into their first deal that they're scared of the management aspect of things, what, what they could kind of do to, to, to minimize the risks. Sure. So, you know, really the way that I manage, um, and so let's just kind of dissect that, right. Mm -hmm. um, collecting rent uh, about six months ago, we moved to a you know software system that uh, does everything for us. Right. So, um, we can do all of our, we do all of our lease signings on there. We can, uh, tenants have their own portals that they can put maintenance requests in. And, you know, I can shoot those directly out to my, my maintenance guys if they need it. I can send it directly to a contractor if I need to. Um, we, we do all of our financial accounting from the same software system. So, you know, when rents come in, they're automatically going to the right account, uh, which makes it easier at the end of the year for your CPA. Um, so that's a big piece of it, right? Like that software handles almost everything, keeps all the information. I literally manage our business from an iPad, right? Like that, that is it. I do it from an iPad. You see me, I carry my iPad around everywhere. Um, I, I do all of our applications online. Somebody wants to move in, uh, they, you know, I send them an online application and they do that. Um, it does their screening from there. And if somebody says, I don't know how to use a computer, I don't have an email, you know, you, you better get one because that's how we handle business, right? Um, but I think a big piece of managing and where a lot of people fail is they fail on training. And, and not training your teams or training yourself, but you got to train your tenants, right? Mm -hmm. So when I move somebody in, I'm very detail oriented with their lease. Like, here's the things that will get you evicted. Here's the things that will have an eye on you for me. Here's the things if you do that we're going to charge you back for, right? So if we come in because you say your, your sink is clogged and I come in and I pull grease out of your sink, well, guess what? You're paying that $120 drain fee. Um, if we, you know, come in and, and, and you've destroyed a door or whatever, you're getting charged back for you, you know, call us and you have a infestation with, with roaches or, you know, unfortunately, sometimes you get bed bugs in the bigger cities. Like if something like that is going on and, and you're not keeping a, a cleanly house or we know you're tracked in, like you're getting charged back for that. So making sure they understand the things that we are responsible for fixing and the things that they're going to be charged back for. But beyond that is how do you contact me to make things efficient, right? Don't call me at 10 o'clock at night because 
you know, your window's dirty or uh, your drain's going down a little bit slow. Like, put that into the maintenance portal. If you have an emergency, like water's coming from your ceiling, there's a fire, there's, um, you know, something going on that's an absolute emergency, they know they can call my cell phone 24 hours a day. Uh, but don't abuse that privilege because then I won't answer your phone calls. So make sure that you're training your tenants and they know when to contact you, when your business hours are. Um, make sure that if they do something outside of what you told them is the right way to handle things, that you're redirecting them and that you're coaching them and telling them the right way to handle things. And sometimes you got to be a little stern and they, and they might get upset. But at the end of the day, you're training them on how to handle things, how you want them to handle things to make your life more efficient. Um, so that's a big piece of how we, you know, how we handle those things. But you always have to have that team that you know is there 24 hours a day, especially if you uh, are going to take vacations or you're going to be out of town. Like you got to have it set up and you got to plan. And, and what I like to do is I also have other investors, not many, like, you know, one or two that are friends. And if one of us is going out of town or one of us has something going on, like we know that we're there to pick each other up and to handle some things. Um, so it's all about pre-planning, right? But you can't, you can't come in and not have a plan. You can't come in and not have a maintenance team. You can't come in and not have you know, emergency phone numbers. And I can, I can tell you horror stories uh, about my properties with, you know, emergencies and things like that. And if I would have been ill prepared or not know who to contact, uh, it would have been a very, very long day or, or long week. So um, just being prepared. Uh, but I think as long as you, you know, lay the groundwork and, you know, train your tenants, then, you know, life is golden until it's not. <laughs> I think that's a, a phenomenal piece of advice. I think anyone listening there, if you take anything away from this is train your tenants. I think that's, you know, you gave some great examples there, you know, of, of what they, they know exactly what to expect, right? They know exactly what the rules are. They know exactly how things work and there's no confusion when anything happens. They know if they don't pay the rent by the fifth, they're going to get eviction notices. If they, if they, um, like you said, if the sink sink is clogged and you get there and it's a bunch of hairs or whatever that they've caused, they're going to get charged for that, you know, and they know, not to call you at midnight because you know the toilet isn't flushing properly or something like that you know it's something minor they know that all these things that the tenants has been told them they know that these are the rules this is how it goes this is what's happening and if you if you veer from that well it's going to be consequences and i think that's so important for people to understand because you have to train your tenants it's so true <laughs> because otherwise they'll walk all over you you know you give Absolutely. them inch, you give them an inch and they'll take a mile and it's just the unfortunate truth of things but it's it's best for everyone because then you know where you stand you, they know where they stand and everyone can get along like that yeah i mean you know look there, there's there's two additional things right and, and number one that i didn't say but you know most people have to know is like consistency like consistency is key and you just mentioned it if you don't, our process is really simple and, and we tell them right off the bat, right? Some of them don't believe us and they test us. You don't pay your rent by the fifth. You immediately get all the late fees, right? So ours is like 10% on whatever's not paid after the fifth. Um, and then we have a $10 per day late fee as long as you leave an outstanding balance. Uh, but the second piece of that is like, I tell them as soon as they move in, like if you don't pay, here's what's gonna happen. But as of the 10th, like I'm putting a three day notice on your door. As of the 13th, I'm filing the eviction on you. Like, and that's going to happen. And if you're not consistent with that and you fail just one time, they'll stretch you and they'll stretch you and they'll, and they'll go. And some landlords, some property owners, you know, they'll, they'll get the emotions in it. And somebody's like, well, I had a hard week and I promise I'm going to pay you. I've been paying you every single month for the last two years and I'm going to pay you next week. And, you know, you'll get a soft heart. Um, as much as I, I love people and I want to be good to people, uh, you got to take your heart out of these situations, right? Like at the end of the day, this is a business. Uh, we're not running a charity. We still have families. We still have mortgages. We still have bills we got to pay. Um, and you got to be consistent with them. But the last piece of that to really cap it off to be successful at managing and successful with your tenants is you got to treat them right and you got to be good to them, you know? So some of the examples for us is, um, you know, Thanksgiving time. Do I have, do I have tenants that I know that are not going somewhere, don't have a family or might not have Thanksgiving food, right? So we make sure we load up some plates and take them to some of those people. At Christmas time, in a lot of our places where I know we have, you know, quite a few kids, you know, my wife and I, we go out buy toys and we bring toys to the complex and make sure they have gifts. You know, I'm, I, I love kids. Like that's my weakness. I coach tons of sports. And like, if I have a soft spot and a heart in landlording, like that's it. Right. But, you know, for me, when I walk around properties, I'll, especially during, you know, school time, I always make sure I have a little bit of cash in my pocket because if they come home and they got the report card, all the kids in my complex know to come up and show Mr. Todd that report card, right? Because I'm giving them X amount of dollars for their A's, X amount of dollars for their B's, and then I'm coaching them on their C's and their D's, right? 
And, you know, we do that. And I, and I think just having that interaction with, with your tenants and them knowing that at the end of the day, you're a good person and you're running a business and, and that's really what it is. And I think they'll respect your property more. They'll respect you more as a landlord. Uh, and they're also not going to test you uh, like they would, you know, newbie or an out-of-state guy that, that might not be as active in the property. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's clear that you're a, a fantastic landlord. You know, you're the type of landlord that everyone should have, I think. And, that, you know, you're, you're the right image that real estate needs, you know, someone who's doing the right thing and giving these people a great place to live, but also, you know, showing some compassion and, and caring towards them as human beings as well. So I think that's, that's phenomenal. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that you have a hundred dollars right now, you know, we're uh, August 5th now. Um, how, how has COVID impacted you at all? Has there been any significant impact or not any at all currently? Well, I, I tell you, for us, we've had very little impact. And it, it's interesting that you bring that up because I, I think like a lot of investors out there, you know, I follow bigger pockets and I try to contribute as much as I can. And that's been a huge conversation. And, and as a matter of fact, there was a thread yesterday that I was reading through and, and there were several of us on there from different parts of the country that said, hey, we're, we're just, we're not affected by COVID. Like we haven't had the results that people are saying we should have, or like some of you're saying, and, and one guy got on there and uh, you know, he, he said, man, you guys are, you guys are obviously lying. You're not telling the truth. Like, you know, COVID affected us. And it brought me to a conversation that I had with uh, um, another investor a couple weeks ago. And I, for us, out of all of our tenants, we had one tenant that blamed COVID for not being able to pay. And actually that was our only delinquency. Like nobody else was delinquent anyway. And, and that tenant had a legitimate story, but you know, I put him in the, in the right place with, the community partners that were offering help for rent and he was immediately able to go down there and get his rent from them and they sent us a check for it so we weren't affected to be honest with you like it didn't affect us but i think when i look at that and i analyze it and i dissect all the moving parts of covid is different landlords and property owners were affected differently right so like our sweet spot is class c you have some that are in class a some that are in class b some in class d um, but the landlords out there that have senior communities that are 55 and older, they weren't affected because everybody, you know, those people are either getting the retirement or they're getting SSI, uh, whatever they're getting. Like in class C, we find that a lot of our tenants, um, one of two things happens with them. They're either getting some type of social security income or they're working a essential job, right? Like they're working as a janitor, they're working as, uh, you know, a custodian, they're working as, um, a, a, a manual labor person and a lot of their jobs were essential. So a lot of our tenants weren't affected by that. I think when you start stepping up more into the class B and, and some of the A, that's where you see people that were affected because a lot of those people um, might not been considered an essential job and they got laid off. Um, so for us, we weren't affected and we're very fortunate and we're blessed for that. Um, but I think there's plenty of landlords out there that I've seen that, that have been affected in different ways. And i you know, I, I, I wish them the best and you know, we pray for them and hope that this gets through, not just for the, the landlords out there, because we know that they have mortgages and things like that, but, but also the tenants, because there's a lot of tenants out there that are struggling. Uh, just for us, we haven't had to deal with that a whole lot. Good. Well, good. I'm glad all your, your tenants were able to pay. And, you know, the, that's a good situation for everyone, right? Because, you know, I'm sure a lot of tenants, they don't necessarily want to not pay. It's just a situation where they can't pay a lot of time. So I'm glad, I'm right. glad that's the case, case for you. Um, cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. Well, this show is called Wrestling with Real Estate, right? I, I did warn you a little bit that there'll be some wrestling themed questions at the end. <laughs> so you, you did, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to just hit you with it. So here we go. Let's 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 try this and see how it goes. What um what would your wrestling name be if you had to come up with a wrestling name? So I thought about this and I I look, there's two ways that I can go. I can be really serious and give myself like this mean, crazy name and, <laughs> and try to scare everybody, but yeah. But I'm gonna I'm gonna do something that I don't usually do. I'm gonna be very vulnerable with you, Barry. Okay. Uh, my my wife and and friends, like close friends, right? So don't call me this if you're not my close friend. But they all have a nickname for me, and my name's Todd. So they call me Toddler. Like that's that's like what they call me, right? Especially my wife. So I was thinking, like, what's my wrestling name, and and like how does that play in? So I'm thinking like Toddler the Baby, and <laughs> and I'm thinking like, and I'm a big WWE guy, right? Like so I loved Ultimate Warrior and The Undertaker and Jake the Snake Roberts, and I'm thinking of my entry with fireworks and, and crazy music, and I'm thinking about coming out like this big diaper, oversized <laughs> bottle, and a rattler, right? Like, just some crazy to throw everybody off, and, and I just see my opponent there. Let's, let's say you, right? You were what, Mason Clay or Clay Mason? What was it? Mason Ryan, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mason Ryan, there you go. 
So you're standing in the ring, you're this big bulk dude. I come out in a diaper and you see me walking down the aisle, like you're not gonna take me seriously, right? Like you're gonna, you're gonna think to myself, like, what in the world is this guy gonna do? And I want to throw you off. Like I want you off. Like I, I want you unbalanced and, and I want you to take me for granted. Um so I I, I think that I think that's what I'm gonna stick with. Toddler. <laughs> the toddler. I like that. I yeah. like that. I like that. And I can see you getting in the ring and you know, everything's fine. And then you throw a tantrum and you, you kill everyone. You just throw a baby yeah. tantrum and you kill everyone. <laughs> so thanks. Thank you for being vulnerable. That's, that's cool. I like that a lot, the toddler. Um, what would your special, what would the toddler's special move be in real estate? So every wrestler has a special move. What would your special move be in real estate? Yeah. So I think staying with kind of what my theme is with, um, you know, I like to pay paths. I like to go ways that, that other people didn't go. I, I, I came up with my own name for my special move, Barry. It's a, uh, the the rattler plex bomb okay yeah so i think for me like i don't think that i'm i, I don't consider myself an expert in like one specific field right like I, I like negotiations i'm pretty good at finding deals i, I think i'm really good at negotiating with with uh, with sellers um i think i'm a good landlord like I, I think that i wrap everything up into a good package i'm not saying i'm the best at everything i'm not saying i'm good with everything um, but i think i'm pretty darn efficient being able to put it all together and uh, kind of the same thing with wrestling, right? So I get I get in that ring, and before they know it, they're wrapped up in like 33 different moves, uh, you know. And I come out on the the other end of it successful. Cool, yeah, very cool, very cool. Uh, I I think I think you're very good at what you do. There's no doubt about that. Um, what's been your biggest body slam you've taken in real estate? Yeah, so I think you know besides the fire, that was that's really the only one that I've lost money on in real estate. Um, and, and I'm still young. I'm, I'm sure that I'm, I'm sure I'm going to have some failures along the way. And, um, but for, for me and not just me, but you know, my wife and I both, uh, in our family, you know, May of uh, May 29th, May 30th, of 2019. So, you know, just a little over a year ago, Dayton got hit by tornadoes that a lot of people saw in the news. And, uh, for us that, that same property, you know, the 30 some units, uh, that property was hit by a tornado. And at that point we, you know, we still had 10 buildings over there at, uh, all 10 of our buildings were hit by the tornado, right? So uh, we had about a, a little over a million dollars in damage with that property. And that came just at the point where we were feeling really good about this. We'd done some really nice things to the property to, to bring it up in value. Uh, we had just raised up quite a few of the rents. Uh, we were 100% occupied at the time. Like things were, things were really, really solid. And when the tornado came through, it, it just it destroyed the whole street. You know, like I said, a little over a million. Um, and we just about a month ago finished up our, our rehab on that that entire property. We got everything and it looks phenomenal now, but, um, so we didn't lose money. We, we had insurance this time, right. And like, they were really good to <laughs> us. Um, and I GC that whole project. So we're able to, you know, save some money here and there. Um, and during that tornado piece, like, you know, we were able to pick up two other buildings on the street, you know, like one for like 2000 bucks and, you know, one for like 30,000 bucks, uh, both of which, you know, we have a total of like maybe 30, $32,000 rehab of both those properties combined you know, and uh, we just had both those appraised, both of them appraised over a hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, no loans on them, they're free and clear. Um, so it was a long period though, right? Like seeing so many tenants displaced and um, you know, I, I basically slept on the property in my car every single night because we had so many looters, right? Wow. Just trying to salvage what little bit was, was still there. Um, you know, not only that, but making sure I had a cooler full every single morning. Uh, of food and drinks to make sure that people that were still living on that street had something, right? Even if it was a candy bar, to make sure the workers were down there. Uh, and it was just, yeah, it, it was tough, man. It was, it was tough. It was tough to see so many people go through it. And, you know, my wife and I talked and it was like, you know, do we take our, do we take our insurance money and, and, and sell the property off kind of cheap because we, we had it free and clear um, or do we fight through this? And, and for us, the decision wasn't based on just us. Um, and I said this uh, to somebody else in an interview the other day, but we looked around and, and we knew that because we own most of the street, that people were looking to us, right? Like they were looking to us for strength. Like, what are you going to do with your properties? Are you going to rebuild them? And it really wasn't even a question for us. We knew we had to get in there and we had to rebuild that street better than ever. Um, and a lot of the properties, I think there's only like eight other buildings on that street that we don't own. They're all one-off owners. And a lot of them didn't have money to fix up their properties and there's still properties sitting there that um, that are boarded up and, and roofs are jacked up on them because the owners have, have vanished and you know unfortunately we can't get a hold of them to buy the properties or whatever uh, but that was a moment where we said you know what it's about the community uh, it's about showing them strength it's about rebuilding the street uh, we know we're going to spend some time on other properties uh, but we also want those tenants to be taken care of 
And, you know, knowing that we had so many tenants that were living in schools and, and makeshift dorms, uh, we knew we had to do something really quick. So we worked hard and, uh, you know, it's, it's been a process, but uh, that was a tough blow. That was probably the hardest thing in my life. And, and there was nights with tears and, you know, trying to figure out where we're going to go from there. And, uh, but, you know, we're back and, and we're better than ever on that property. And, uh, you know, but, but that was probably the hardest one we've had in real estate. Yeah, sounds rough, sounds rough. But thank you for sharing. I'm glad you guys made it through. I'm sure all the tenants are. And everyone who's living on that street are thankful for what you guys have done. Um, was there a moment that you were standing on the top rope, getting ready to jump in the, the, the real estate ring, but you were scared? Um, what was it? How did you overcome it? Well, I think there's been a couple moments in my life, right? Um, you know, the first one was right after the fire. And uh, we were coming on that 30, 34 units or you know, whatever it was there for the owner financing that we talked about, which was the third deal. And I, I was, you know, I was, I was petrified, man. Like I didn't have money at that point still, you know? And, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, how do I take this on? Because at the end of the day, it wasn't, the owner financing was great. I wasn't bringing any down payment, but in fact, my mind was every six months, I got to come up with like six, $7,000 in taxes, right? Like every three months I got to come up with four or $5,000 in water bills. Mm -hmm. And you know, what happens if I don't have tenants? What happens if, if I have a vacancy, what happens if like all of a sudden everybody stops paying rent? And I almost didn't do that deal uh, because I was so scared and it was uh, no money out of my pocket, which is the craziest thing. <laughs> like if you told me, if you told me that today, like, <laughs> like jump on, give me 20 of those properties. But back then it was like worst case scenario, knowing that I didn't have reserve funds if something happened, even though I wasn't coming up with a single dollar out of my pocket for that property. Um, and I, 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 I almost walked away from that deal. I almost walked away and didn't do it. And you know, now that's, that's the home run of our portfolio and, you know, that property now appraises, um, you know, we haven't had appraised here recently, but uh, we've had a couple of the buildings and that property now appraises, you know, with our cap rates that we're running probably right around 1.7 million. Wow. Um, so, you know, we've, we've, uh, you know, we've forced appreciation on that building by over a million dollars. So that gives you kind of a, a little insight of what we bought that property for, but, you know, we forced appreciation over a million dollars on that property. Um, but I almost walked away from that and uh, it would have been a bad day if I was sitting here now and had to tell the story about <laughs> walking away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Well, cool. Well, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for getting in the ring with me. Uh, I think we both survived. Nobody's got any black eyes. so <laughs> we... Not yet, man. <laughs> well, cool. Well, thank you so much for, for giving up your time today, Todd, and being part of this interview and sharing, you know, the wealth of knowledge that you have and um, the experience that you have with, you know, you know owning the 100 doors by yourself and just, you know, being so active in real estate. It's, 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 fantastic to hear your stories and you know to be able to buy a lot of these deals with creative financing and not involve banks and just you know going direct to sellers using your negotiation skills is is a lesson for so many people like you said you, you know people believe that it can't be done but you're living proof that it can be done so thank you for sharing that today yeah absolutely man i'm glad you had me on here and uh you know i i can't wait to continue watching your journey with your uh, with your YouTube and I'm sure you have some podcast out and, and everything else you do in, in real estate, man. So I'm pumped Thank up to, to stay behind you and watch you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Uh, before we go, if anyone wants to get, reach out to you, hear about more about your company or some, some deals that you're doing or j just in general, just to reach out to get a hold of you, how, how, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so I'm on uh, I, I'm not a big social media guy, right? But I am on bigger pockets under my name, Todd Holtz. Um, that's, that's an easy way I follow that. I'm, I'm on Instagram under my name. Um, you can also email me, uh, my wife and I's company, it's called bottom to the top investments. Uh, so our email address is pretty simple. Uh, it's just the initials of each word. So B T T T I L L C at gmail.com. Um, and you know, if you jump on one of those sites, you can find my contact info and give me a shout. And, uh, I think Barry, you're, you're living proof. I'll, I'll get right back with you. I love talking real estate and, you know, I could stay up till odds ends of the hours of the early morning to talk, man. So just reach out if you, if you guys need anything or just want to chat. Cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm the same way. I just love talking. It's so much fun to, to talk. We, I think we were discussing this yesterday. When you find someone who's interested in real estate as well and loves talking about it just as much as you, it's a great thing because <laughs> then you, you don't have to feel guilty about talking their ear off about real estate. So I, I appreciate you coming on today and it's been definitely a lot of fun for me. And I look, look forward to keep, hopefully keeping connecting with you and keep hearing these great stories about your su success. So yeah, have a great absolutely, Barry. Thanks for, having, for coming on and I, I really appreciate you giving the time. All right. Thanks a lot.